many of you have heard me talk about my upbringing in a beloved community uh, where every single adult was in one way or another invested in the growth and success of the next generation uh, of which I was then, and now I'm the generation investing in now that next generation. Uh, our community relied on many black women who shaped nearly every part of our households, our schools, our churches, and our networks of support. At that time, many of those women didn't have the resources or support to start their own businesses. And even though they became experts and teachers and producers of goods and services uh, that enriched our lives, they lacked systemic resources being uh, driven to them to improve the condition of the community that they cared about. And whether it was my mother who was instilling the importance of investing in others, or Mrs. Buckner who was teaching piano down the street, they were all important contributors to our community and the growth of our community. And I can only imagine what they would have been able to accomplish if they had capital and resources that, frankly, you know, you all now have access to. They were held back by the dual shackles of race, racial and gender discrimination and what heights they would have reached if they had intentional capital investments into them and their businesses. Unfortunately, many of those constraints endure today and that's why this program is so important. While 11.6% of the U.S. population lives in poverty, that rate jumps to 18.8% for, for black women. And we all know that owning a business is one of the most efficient ways to produce generational wealth and escape the cyclical nature of poverty. But only one and a half percent of black women own a business. This is due partly to the barriers they must overcome to launch their ventures, including the fact that they are 20% less likely to be, able to, fund, to be able to fund their business with bank loans. And typically they receive less than 1% of annual venture capital investing. These disparities contribute to the enduring racial wealth gap, which currently stands at 13 to 1, even worse than when Dr. King was pushing for economic justice. Back then, it was 8 to 1. It's a sad but motivating number. And as we gather in Dr. King's birthplace, again, three years after the murder of George Floyd, that work of, an, of ending systemic racism and establishing economic equality is far from complete. And in preparing for today, I couldn't help but think about Dr. King's words in 1968. We know it isn't enough to integrate lunch counters. What does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't earn enough money to buy a hamburger and a cup of coffee? The good news is there was a consulting firm who we haven't partnered with on this, so I won't mention their name reported that in February that corporations pledged about $340 billion to driving racial equity between May 2020 and October 2022. And unfortunately, that report also observed, but how it's spent remains unclear. The challenge we face today as we honor Dr. King, George Floyd, and the countless others who pushed our nation to recognize the humanity of black Americans including the late daughter of Atlanta, Dr. Rosalind Pope, and our beloved Mayor Andy Young, is to identify how that $340 billion is being spent. Is it done in collaboration with local communities? And most importantly, what impact is, is it generating for the lives of black people? In my work, we've tried to contribute to the answers for Dr. King's question, Dr. King's question in many ways. We've established a student freedom initiative to enable thousands of many of young people to graduate from historically black colleges and universities free from the shackles of debt. Some of you may know, black women owe 22% more on average than white women of student loan debt. We put together a program to equip our communities and HBCUs with the technical exp expertise required to secure their fair share of federal broadband dollars that will be announced later this month. We need all of you to encourage our government to ensure that happens equitably. And at my firm, Vista Equity Partners, we joined with BCG, PayPal, and the Kellogg Foundation to establish the Southern Communities Initiative, of which this group is now a part. 
Through SEI, we're working with local leaders across six communities. A 100-mile radius around those communities is home to half of the African-American community, to Atlanta, Birmingham, Charlotte, Houston, Memphis, and New Orleans. And to make it easier for those corporate leaders and those pledges to deploy their resources into shovel-ready projects that can deliver measurable impact on the ground, just like the Scrameen program. Based on local priorities, SCI is focused on four issues. Wealth creation, minority business and supplier diversity, HBCU and workforce development, and digital access. And I am grateful to Grameen that they partnered with us here in Atlanta, as well as in Memphis and in Birmingham. I also want to thank Regents Bank CEO John Turner and his team for answering SEI's call and for joining us in supporting Grameen's development of a program focused on black women. I'm hopeful more businesses and CEOs will follow John's lead to stand up and reaffirm their commitment to inclusion and equity across their workforces, supply chains, businesses, and communities. Others have joined us as well, and although much work remains, we've made some meaningful progress. Since we launched two years ago, SEI has helped deploy nearly $350 million in capital for minority and small businesses as part of J.P. Morgan's $30 billion commitment. We've invested $535 million in Economic Opportunity Coalition to support black and other minority businesses with our partner PayPal. And we've secured funding to modernize more than a dozen CDFIs and MDIs, which are our banking capillary infrastructure, to strengthen their technical infrastructure and enable their ability to deploy capital into these communities. We've also partnered with the Student Freedom Initiative and Cisco and other partners to upgrade the technical infrastructure at now 48 HBCUs. These partnerships show that we can make progress in closing the racial wealth gap if we join together with local leaders who know their communities best. And as I said before, much of this begins with investing in black women. So I wanna thank you all again for the tremendous work you do every day. It is a privilege to join you. And it is a privilege to work against these issues and I look forward to learning about the many businesses that get launched and the jobs that they create and the economic activity that they enable in Atlanta and beyond. So thank you all for being a part of this and let's go make this happen.